<laughs> oh, oh, ah, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, this is nervous laughter. It's all nervous laughter. Oh, oh, crumbs. Oh, <laughs> oh. whoa. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Today I am driving just about the strangest thing you can possibly think of. It's a Carver One, and I know you're jealous. <laughs> Wee! decades now we've been pondering the solution to our twin problems of inner city congestion and pollution. Little did we know but apparently the answer is actually a five meter long three ton thousand horsepower electric SUV. Silly us for not having realized that earlier but decades ago there were a few other people who thought they had a better solution. One of which was the smart car and another is this, the Carver One. <laughs> oh my word, that's so scary. As you've probably worked out by now, if you haven't already heard of the Carver One, calling it a car seems perhaps a little bit disingenuous, but I'm not actually sure really what to call it. It feels like the result of the unholy union between a smart car and a BMW C200. So it's part car, part bike, part, I don't know, something else entirely. At the back, you have two 15-inch wheels, and those are connected to a 660cc Daihatsu K-Car engine, making 85 horsepower. But it's up front where things get a little bit unconventional, because you have a single 17-inch motorbike wheel. And while a three-wheeler is far from a new concept, the way this car deals with the inherent instability of that setup is because as you've probably noticed, this cabin sits on a sort of hydraulic setup that pivots, so you lean in the corner a little bit like a motorbike. This is terrifying. It is also just a little bit brilliant. Are you on the hunt for a Dutch tricycle? Well, good luck finding one. But if you do, make sure to perform a car vertical search. In just 60 seconds, and with only a registration plate or a VIN number, a car vertical search will perform all of the necessary checks on any potential used car purchase, including accident damage, regardless of whether a car has been written off or not, mileage discrepancies, outstanding finance, usage as a taxi, which does seem unlikely, and even handy hints and tips, common model failure points on some of the more popular makes, which does not include a Carver. Car Vertical have also recently revised their reports, making them even easier to read than ever before. And for 10% off the service, don't forget to use my link in the description down below and my discount code, which is JM. <laughs> Whee! The Dutch don't exactly have a long and illustrious history of car makers, and in fact, I can't think really in modern memory of a single mainstream Dutch manufacturer. Just about the only other two that I care to mention would be Spiker and Donkerfort, and let's face it, neither of those are particularly conventional either. But this, even by comparison, is pretty nuts. Finding information on this has been relatively difficult. It was produced by a company called Vandenbrink. In 2003, there was a prototype, and you may remember having seen it on Top Gear back in the day. However, I don't think they actually sold any until a few years later, after they'd gone into collaboration with ProDrive and managed to productionize it. Initially, sales targets were some 200 a year for the UK market alone, but all told, between 240 and 250 of them were actually made full stop. The company is sort of still in existence today, whether it's still Vandenbring or not, but the Carver does exist, and perhaps predictably, it has become an electric vehicle. This was designed from the off as a solution to inner city transport problems, and I suppose in that regard, making it electric does actually make an awful lot of sense. Oh crikey, it just feels so weird and wrong this. 
I'm used to motorbikes and I'm used to cars, but nothing prepares you for the experience of this. Handily for me, this car is a very cool and brave owner. Joel has actually had it since new. Yeah, he is one of the people nuts enough to have bought one back in the day. And you did have to be pretty nuts to buy one because where the smart car was already considered perhaps a little bit too expensive for a two-seater at £8,000 and the more upmarket A-Class with four seats and a boot was about double that, this was nearer 30 grand, between 25 and about 28,000 pounds, depending on how you spec it and who you ask, making it essentially the same money as a Lotus Elise. And for the vast majority of petrol heads, an Elise simply had more appeal. This is also one of the few cases where I can say that an Elise is more practical. This is a two-seater in what they call a tandem configuration. In other words, your passenger goes behind. And uh, this morning, believe it or not, I did get in the back of this. Now, full disclosure, it was a little bit snug in there and getting the seatbelt on was tricky, but as we were only traveling a couple of hundred yards, it wasn't all that concerning. You have two footrests, one either side of the driver, so the passenger's legs go right down here. I apologize that my face is right in your face, but uh, one of the other issues I've had with this car is that rigging it is um, quite difficult. If I were to put my main camera in the cabin, it, um, well, it would kind of obscure all my visibility and get in the way. <laughs> there is also no boot whatsoever. That is essentially the rear seat. So it's a rather impractical little thing. Although visibility is superb. You have glass everywhere, including all the way up to here which can be problematic because there is no sun visor of any description. There's a little sort of tint on it, that's it. And so, on brighter days like today, sunglasses or a hat are, I'm told, an essential accessory. Unlike the smart car, the gearbox is actually relatively conventional. A five-speed manual, which is down here to the right, but it's not particularly good. The steering has quite a bit of weighting, though not masses of feel. And um, you do actually have two fully opening windows. I say fully opening. Oh, 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 uh, oh no, no, I'm, I'm, re I'm not trying to do that sort of stuff. Let's, let's see what the windows are like. Oh, do they open? Yeah, they do open basically all the way. Uh, uh, there's no rear view mirror, but it doesn't need one. To be honest, it would be pointless anyway. The speed limit on this road is about 60 mile an hour, but honestly, I don't think I've troubled it at all today. Oh, that's quite refreshing. That's quite nice. Yeah, I like that. But you probably don't. So I'm gonna put those back up. There is just the one door and it's on this side because you've got all the controls down here. There isn't much in terms of luxury or features or anything in here, but um, the overall effect I suppose is okay. You've got a little bit of leather on the dash. The seat is comfortable enough, but um, you don't really look at the interior to be honest. So it's not really that much of an issue. The engine, I have to say, is fairly limp and flat. Much of the original documentation that I could find in old reviews said that it was actually a 68 horsepower lump, which was good enough for 0 to 60 in about eight seconds and a top speed of some 114 mile an hour. Allegedly, the engine upgrade taking this to the 84, 85 horsepower I'm told it now has would have obviously improved the 0 to 60 a little bit and up to the top speed to 145 mile an hour, but I'm reasonably confident that is a misprint. Not only do I not want to do 145 mile an hour in this car, I'm also reasonably confident that it won't do it. Just up here above the dash, where I annoyingly can't see it, you do have a little gauge that tells you how far you're lent over, up to a maximum of 45 degrees. <laughs> it is quite a laugh. It doesn't like being adjusted mid-corner. Very, very disconcerting when you do that. <laughs> the brakes are okay. Now I found ourselves in a little bit of traffic. Let me talk you through some of the reasons that this was always, always doomed to be a stupid idea. Much of it, as you might imagine, has to do with the three wheel layout, which is just utterly and totally daft. First off, if it's winter and there is slush or crap on the roads, your middle wheel, and to be honest, in something like this, all of your wheels 
are right in the middle of it. In a car, of course, your wheels either side and on a motorbike, you can choose which lane you want to be in. This though, the middle wheel is gonna be plowing all the way down the road in the bit where everybody else has piled up all the dirt, snow, slush, or whatever. Anyone who's driven a Reliant Robin will know exactly what I'm talking about. Should you break down, you're also going to need specialist equipment, even if that just means a third ramp, because you need one for the middle wheel and two for the rears. Although it doesn't look it, it is actually only marginally longer than a smart car by about 30 centimetres a foot or so. It is only two thirds the width, one metre rather than 1.5, but that's only when it's lent upright. And if you're not careful, it's very, very easy when going around a bend such as this to lean yourself over the white lines, which as you might imagine, can incur some danger. Little bits of road like this too, where you've got some seriously aggressive camber potholes and the like, it just doesn't enjoy. The ride quality isn't terrible. This is a pretty bad piece of road. It's fairly demanding and it's handling it better than I expect, but there are sections where it gets a little bit flummoxed, I have to say. It is also constantly creaking, which is a frustration, but um, that might just be my seating position and a little bit of leather. Oh, oh stuff like this, oh, crumbs. Yeah, I, uh, it does not enjoy this. There's a really, really severe bit of camber on this road and it does not like it at all. It's doing a very, very good job and I suppose over time you begin to trust it and Joel evidently does. He enjoys weird, wacky and wonderful stuff. He's previously had Lancia Delta Integrale, a Fiat X19 and various other cool cars. He likes holding on to them for a long time too. And I can absolutely get why he's kept a hold of this. Though they were expensive new, they were also something, I suppose, of a kind of smart purchase because they've held their money. In fact, on the rare occasion these have come up for sale, I've seen them go for between 30 and 35 thousand pounds. Pretty, pretty darn good that actually for a car that cost 27 when it was new. As the gearbox warms up, I am told it does get worse, which is not helpful. Because the dash is quite so far down there and it's also fairly dark and the cabin's so light, it is actually quite difficult to quickly check and see what speed you're actually doing. Because this is quite so alien to just about anything else, your concept of speed is um, a little bit wonky when you're in it. Potholes, I think, are also a real concern with a car like this and um, there's not really an awful lot you can do about it. I am told that Carver never really had much of a professional operation here in the UK. It was essentially a couple of blokes what thought it was a good idea and the test drive was conducted from the car park of South Mim Services. Today though, if you want to service them, one enterprising gentleman who thought that it was a fairly good idea apparently bought lots and lots of the spares for them, in fact potentially all of the spares. He's based over in Wales and he is essentially the guy. So if you want work done, it can be done and spares do exist, but you're unlikely to find a local carver specialist. Most humorously, I think, is the fact that today, if you want one of the new electric ones, whether they actually even exist or not, I don't know, the website has a real air of like, this is actually a prototype, we haven't really made any yet. But one of them is a sort of, you know, modern day equivalent to this with a lower speed and short range, as is the case with all electric stuff. But the other one is a van. Yeah, somebody looked at this and went, hey, you know that silly, crazy trike thing that we've got that leans over all the time? Can we put a boot on it and call it a van? Joel seems to think that it'll be okay because, you know, physics dictates that although you'll be leaned over when you're in a bend, you're doing some speed. But as demonstrated back there, when you are going around a tight bend at two mile an hour, it will still lean over. And um, I think also Joel has perhaps a little bit too much faith in van drivers. There is no type of tomfoolery on the road you can conceive of that a van driver cannot do. They're the kind of unsung test pilots of the modern age, white van drivers. Could you imagine if Pizza Hut bought one of these? All of your toppings would be all off to one side every time you got a delivery with one. I mean, it's, it's fun and it's hilarious and everything. There is even a cup holder down here. It's got a spanner in it, which is kind of worrying. And I am having fun and all that, but um, it is, a, it is a little bit weird, the whole thing.
It's fair to say that the carver is quite unlike anything else you've ever likely encountered, and in the brief time I had with it, it left me somewhat frustrated. The reason being, the steering wheel I'm told is directly related to the tilt angle of the cabin, and the hydraulics act as essentially a form of power steering. It also countersteers the front tyre as you would on a motorbike, and the wheels at the back will also help to steer you too. However, on a bike, you lean with your body as much as anything else, but in here, you do not. Meanwhile, in a car, as you ramp up speed, you don't need to turn the wheel anywhere near as much to get around a bend. My experience of the carver told me that was not the case with this. Several times, I approached a corner and found myself panicking because I turned the wheel what felt like the right amount, only for it not to be anywhere near enough. I suspect that if you were to test drive one of these in town, where it is designed to excel, you'd wind up doing exactly what I did, shaking yourself about and not feeling like you gelled with the machine. Joel assures me that actually it's a very pleasant drive once you're used to it, and I don't doubt him. My brief passenger ride in the back showed me that it is possible to pilot one smoothly, however it certainly isn't the work of a few minutes. And, though I didn't exactly get on with it, I would really welcome the opportunity to have a second go at the Carver at some point in the near future, because this is a vehicle that I really, really feel like I've only scratched the surface of. In fairness, I've only driven this for the sort of 10-15 minutes. Joel has taken this to the shops on many occasions. It turned up with shopping and stuff in the back of it. He's taken it to Scotland in a month. What a legend. What an absolute ruddy legend. The clutch is nice and easy enough, as is the brake. The pedals are by Tilton as well. And uh, the last thing I think I saw with Tilton pedals was an aerial atom. The red line in here is about 7,500, which will make you think it's a nice peppy, revvy little engine, but it's not. It gets to about six and it's kind of dumb, but that really is what I would expect from a K car engine. It's certainly not lacking for pace, and honestly, if they offered me this with double the power, I'd say thank you, but no thank you. Oh, you're going to pull out in front of me? Yes. Yes, please do. I will cut through you like a knife. Other things I've noticed, the handbrake, it's a conventional item, it's located down there, just sort of below your right knee, but it's so far away from me, I, mean, I can't even feel it from here, now it's off, and to get it off, I had to unbuckle the seat belt, lean down there, and then you're perilously close to the gear lever, so I was worried that in the process of trying to turn the handbrake off, I was gonna knock it into gear, stall it, damage the gearbox, or, or whatever, it was a, a little bit, um, inelegant. Getting shoehorned into the back was also just not that delicate whatsoever and uh, the simple fact is that for a regular city runabout a smart car is just infinitely superior. It has a massive cabin by comparison, feels also nice and light and airy. It's got a boot, not a big one, but it has one and it was about a quarter the price. The controls behind the wheel are all very, very conventional. In fact, they're one of the few things. Oh my word! I feel like I could just reach out. Oh no! Yeah, turning circle is abysmal. Where's the reverse? There. Okay. Oh, and I've stalled it. I've stalled it. I'm taking up the whole road. I've stalled it. Oh, this is. Oh, I beached. I think I beached it a little bit as well. Might be why I stalled it. And there's people looking at me funny. Oh, blimey. Yeah, okay, so ground clearance, not very good. That's a worry. And I have to say, I do just have concerns that that front tire isn't enough. Now, fact is, these aren't very heavy, lighter even than a smart car, six to seven hundred kilos. But that means there's not a lot of weight pressing down on said wheel, and so, yeah, cheers. And so, if conditions aren't great, I do worry it would just understeer into the nearest hedgerow. I am told on great authority that that is not the case, but I kind of remain skeptical. Very skeptical, actually. Let's just take a moment to acknowledge the fact that this never 
ever had a chance of actually being the solution to inner city mobility. Never. Not at all. It's daft in concept and I think it could be even dafter in execution. But it does have the distinction of being a genuinely unique automobile. I can, as a biker and a car enthusiast, say, hand on heart, it is unlike anything else I have ever driven or ridden. £35,000 might seem like a lot of money to buy one of these, but I'll give you two darn good reasons why you might still want to consider buying one. First off, on a road like this in a Lamborghini Aventador, you would be, oh, crushed. I don't care how many cylinders, how much horsepower, how many wheels, whatever it is that you dream of has. At 30 mile an hour, through a bend like this, it's unlikely to have quite the same effect and be quite as dramatic as a Carver one. Secondly, you think you need to spend £200,000 on a Lamborghini Aventador as the ultimate poser wagon? No, 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 no. I guarantee you, you rock up at any nightclub, any car show, any event, anywhere in one of these, you'll be the star of the day. <laughs> oh my word, oh it's, oh it's so scary and it keeps making weird fart noises. Anyway, that is enough from me. This is the Carver One, and I hope you've enjoyed today's video. I want to say a big thank you to Joel for bringing it out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.